E-commerce hyper growth is the theme of today's talk, and I'm going to be giving a peek into the minds of the 1%, the guys in the mastermind. Yes, you're in the 1%. They're quite scary minds at times, but they're fun. And most importantly, I hope you take away from this not a bunch of actionable, tiny tactics or like 50 billion spreadsheets, because you must be getting death by PowerPoint at this point of the day, but I'm trying to give you some mindset shifts which sounds like woo-woo stuff, but I promise this is the most concrete version I can give of why these guys are doing well. So first question then, uh, what do Amazon third-party sellers make each year on average? Any thoughts? Any, I'll start the bidding at $10,000. Anyone think $10,000? Come on guys, interactive audience. How many people think that Amazon third-party sellers on average make $10,000 a year? Yeah, one person, okay, it's going well. Interactive audience here, $30,000. Okay, 50,000, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000. Okay, you're closest, sir. I'll buy you a beer afterwards because it is $90,000. I made that statement in public in front of witnesses now, don't I? I'm going to have to buy you that. I'm happy to buy it because you interacted. It's what we need up here. Good. 90,000, right? But there's lies, down lies, and statistics. What percentage of active sellers make over $100,000? Give me a percentage. Anyone for 50%? 30%, 10%, how much? 20, okay, 20, 10. The actual number is just about 10% of active sellers. I'm sorry? Revenue, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll discuss profit later. <laughs> what percentage of active sellers make over a million dollars a year then? It's obviously less than 10%. I'll give you a clue for free. 3%, 2%, anybody? What, yes, 1%? Yeah, okay, yeah, you got, I'm not buying you guys a beer because there's a lot of you on your right. 1%, 30,000 sellers approximately. So it's quite a lot of people in absolute terms, but in percentage terms, obviously, quite a small number. So the amazing FBA masterminds help six and seven figure sellers to double their Amazon revenue every one to two years, ideally. And, this, and that's the end of the sales pitch, but this is what I'm referring to. This is my lab that I get the data from, if you like. So 1% is about two thirds of the mastermind members from the 10K Collective and Million Pound Masterminds. Um, I like to come up with complicated names. So we've got quite a lot of businesses, it's about 13, 14 people, that we know intimately that we can learn from. That's what I'm bringing you to, to you today. So the obvious question is, what are they doing that 99% aren't, right? It's an obvious question, but I want to posit the danger of that. Because if you give a man a fish, complete this well-known saying, feeding for a day, right? But if you give it to an Amazon seller, they'll go and optimize the fish and try and feed the family of four for two years by optimizing one listing. Yeah, yeah, it's not a joke, right? You've all been there, we've all been, I've been there because it's such a danger. So I think a better question is really in order because copying what everyone else does is like, a, is like a, an epidemic, it's not a disease. It's the Ebola of Amazon. Sorry, I've probably been offensive now. Shoot, shoot to the style of the, the 10K Collective there. I think where you focus is where your actions happen, and when that happens, that's where you get the results. If you start focusing on copying everyone all the time, you're behind the curve. I don't think that's the way to really beat the market. I think it's about how they're seeing things, right? So my aim in this talk is to help you see like the 1%, because I believe very fully in clear seeing and clear goals gives potent action, and seeing in a fog means you thrash around a lot, analyze a lot of spreadsheets, try and optimize the fish, and end up starving, to mix my metaphors. So this is about how you change, how you see the world, looking through a different lens. Right, the first, there are three basic lenses I wanna talk about. The first is the star principle and the 80-20, which you think you know about, but I'm here to tell you it goes way deeper than you think. The second one is the Taoist chef. I love this story. We'll see what that's about in a minute. And the third one is, the third lens is influence. So let's plunge in. The first lens, the star principle on the 80-20. Um, the wrong lens is not average. We talked about average. If you were really smart, you would have noticed that earlier I said um, the average revenue for Amazon sellers is $90,000, but only 10% of people are doing over 100,000. So that shows that there's something very wrong with using average to tell you. I think it's the wrong lens. 
the average gives us a really terrible steer, and this is one of the main lenses you've got to change. And if you remember nothing else from this, I've done you a great service. I can't tell you how deep this stuff goes. And if you want to go really deep on 80-20, talk to Perry Marshall. So average gets taught because human biology tends towards averages. So human height, weight, or age. So Sultan is the world's tallest living man at eight feet, two inches tall, which is just incredibly tall. But it's only 48% taller than the global average for men, which is 171 centimeters. By the way, I'm a stats nerd, sorry. But if you get into Amazon, you're gonna be the same. I'm sorry, guys, if you're not in there already. I mean, you think I'm a stats nerd, I'm looking at people at the back who just love spreadsheets. So the world's tallest and shortest men actually met once for, um, um, it's pretty crazy how different they are in height. But if you look at the heights of these ordinary cameramen here, and then the heights of these guys, sure, it's an extreme difference, but it's 440, 50% difference which is all it's not how a sultan measures himself when he goes home and speaks to his family. But average is a fair guide, right? Because they're outliers of one, if I have a, do I have a, a sort of thing I can point with here? Yes, I do, here, here, and here. So this is obviously the extreme average of low, and this is extreme high, but it's a fair approximation, because in this room, if we lined everyone up in height order, apart from really annoying you, joke, you're allowed to laugh. Um, it would roughly look a bit like that. You'd probably be in the middle of the bell curve, right? Obviously. But this is the bit I want you to take home, if nothing else. Average is a stupidly distorting lens in business. It's absolutely crazy. There's no physics limits to business, in essence. I mean, if you're trying to deliver products yourself from your garage, yes, there'll be a physical limit. But in essence, we've got a scalable business and system with Amazon, particularly. There's no limits, which means that pretty much all business numbers like revenue, there's no practical or upper or lower limit. So net worth is a classic example. Many people have negative net worth, which is not possible with height, for example, or weight, right? You can't weigh, you can't weigh minus 10 kilograms, but you can be worth minus 15 million pounds if you're in massive debt, for example. Um, the average net worth, I think this is Credit Suisse um, stats, is $70,845. Now there's spurious precision, right? It means almost nothing because the, the, the world's richest person, Jeff Bezos, is worth. Let's have a guess here. Let's take, make sure you stay awake. How many people think $50 billion? Hundreds? 110? 120? 130? I, I can't afford to buy any more beers, but you're the closest. $130 billion. 131, sorry. And by the way, look at the curve of that. That is a classic curve of somebody who has got their strategy right. <laughs> So he is approximately 185 million percent richer than the global average, which is an insane number because the top 1% also own nearly 50% of global wealth as well. Whereas Sultan is just 48% higher than the global average height for men. So average works with humans, but it really is a just astronomically bad way, in my opinion, of looking at Amazon or indeed most business, particularly Amazon. This is, of course, 80-20. The economist Vilfredo Pareto published this in 1896. Now let that sink in for a sec. But this is pretty much just after the invention of the car. This is before TV, it's before radio. This has been around, but it, people sort of go know it, but they don't really know it because they're not really seeing things that profoundly. And if, as I said, nothing else, if you take nothing else away, go and deep dive into this, especially when I'm a mass nerd. So it's even more skewed than 80-20 online quite often. So if you look at 10% of active sellers, I just put this graph in using a tool called 8020curve.com. And if you're really a maths nerd like me, you'll love to look at that because you can play with that tool. It is frighteningly accurate, this tool, right? Let, let me show you the right lens is 80-20. Let me show you how it works. This tool, I just put in, all I put in, two numbers. 2.9 million members. That's the number of people with an active seller account. In other words, they have a listing, doesn't mean they're making sales, that's about 2.4 million. And the mean, the average output, $90,000. That's all I put into this tool, and I asked it to, as a result, predict how many members were gonna produce more than a million dollars, in fact, between a million and a billion. And it predicted 20,000 members. Now that's pretty fair, because actually it's 30,000 in reality. To get the 30,000, people went out and gathered a shed load of actual real world data. This is just predicting based on two numbers. What that tells me is 80-20 is an incredibly accurate prediction tool for dealing with, amongst other things, Amazon selling. An average clearly is bullshit because how many people here are making over $90,000 a year on Amazon? I know you guys are because you're in the mastermind. Okay, 
Well, that's not half the room, is it? And that's what we intuitively feel when we hear an average that it means about half, but it's not even slightly close. Is this coming over? Great. If you remember nothing else, I've done my job here. So, however, I'd love you to keep listening. So an accurate lens is 80-20, in my opinion. Hopefully just prove that. Very related to this then is another thing called the STAR principle. Again, if you take nothing else away, I've done a great service to you. The STAR principle is um, by a couple called Richard Koch. And Richard Koch, unlike pretty much everyone, did not write a series of books and become rich from writing books about how to become rich. He sold a business for about a few million when he retired from his business, and he invested that, and following his own principles, which who the hell does that? He made himself worth about 300 billion, sorry, 300 million pounds. Sorry, I'm getting used to throw B words around today. 300 million pounds. It's not as rich as Jeff, but from five million, that's an incredible start. That's why I trust this guy, right? So this isn't just a nice business theory. It's stuff he used to make himself rich. Comes from the Boston Consulting Group. And by the way, this goes back to the 60s. This is not you either, but people just don't use it. So first thing is you've got two aspects to deal with. Market growth, over 10% a year, or under 10% a year. And then you've got how much you lead the market. So if you're the leader um, versus if you're a follower. By the way, leader defined quite toughly as you make about twice as much revenue as everybody else, your nearest competitor. You dominate the market. And that's a total clue. There are four categories of business or product that come from this. The first is the star business or star product. And it's pretty easy to say and hard to do, but I, if you only aim to just create or find or buy star businesses or products, that is going to incredibly serve you and your net worth in the future. It sounds an obvious thing to do, but it's very easy to fall into traps when you're in real life, because the next thing is a cash cow. So if you've got a product that's selling on Amazon and the growth of the market slowed down, like my trusty iPhone, um, for example, that's now the iPhone market's going about 10% a year or, or something like that. So Apple is no longer, a, you've got a star business on its hands with their iPhone, but it's a cash cow. They are an incredibly cash rich company for that reason. So um, a cash cow is actually a good thing. The next one is a dog. We obviously don't want a dog, a bad product. Um, but in all honesty, if you've been selling on Amazon for a while, you probably, if you had to assess, am I a market leader? No. Is this market growing fast? No. You'd have to be hand on heart honest and say you have a few dogs in your portfolio. And this is a big picture stuff because I'm sure you'll have got painful amounts of tactical detail and hacks, hacks to, hacks to fill your boots with. But this is kind of so big picture that it looks obvious. But once it's like Dan Kennedy said, when the guru of internet, uh, sort of direct marketing said, once you get in the swamp, all you want to do is get away from the alligators, right? The Chinese black hat sellers and what have you. But you've got to remember why the hell you got in there in the first place. And this is it, is to find a star product. If you take, just like Amazon has, e-commerce is growing about 12% a year, and Amazon is growing its market share. That is what Jeff Bezos' wealth went like that. That is the characteristic of a star business, right? So it's incredibly, incredibly different. It's something like 600% more return than a, a merely average business. And then, of course, we've got the, that mind F, I'm not sure why I'm supposed to swear, <laughs> which is the question mark. So, okay, you're in a really fast-growing market, but you're a follower. Can you turn that into a leader? And by the way, lots of us are there in Amazon because there's lots of fast-growing markets for, I don't know, back braces or something insane. But if you're a follower, you better be damn sure you can take the leader out because that's going to cost you a lot of money and, and effort because the leader's not going to just roll over and die. The leader is going to fight back, <laughs> drop their price and up their ad spend, right? How many people have experienced that already? I can say, look for the actual Amazon sellers in the room. So let's look at the, what they're doing because I know you're aching to know what they're doing. Never mind the theory. What are they actually doing? Well, first of all, they're going for the big fish in a small pond idea. So the, Several members are by far and away, they have two or three listings on page one, maybe in position one, position three, and they have um, a big percentage of the revenue on page one. And it's much easier to do that in a small pond. So if you're selling something very specific like back braces for very tall people or something in the UK, don't do this at home. It's a terrible, it's the new garlic press, by the way, don't sell it. <laughs> thank you, good. And you tittered, thank you. Oh, I feel like I'm, something's happening here. Uh, Got to keep the audience with me. Because it's statistics, right? It could be very dull. 
but don't sell back braces, but in a tiny market in the UK, way easier to dominate than back brace, full stop, in the USA. Which just occasionally I have a, a client who doesn't do Amazon yet and come to me with that idea. And I just look at them and I go, right. So there's a total addressable market size, and then there's the bit you can win. The only bit that counts is the bit you can win. Doesn't matter how big the pie is, it matters how big your slice of the pie is as a percentage. So you're way better off dominating a market for something that sells $50,000 or equivalent a month than you are going for a million dollars a month revenue and just taking $10,000. That looks like it's quite a good product idea, but you're gonna be squeezed out by the competition. I haven't got time to go into all the reasons why that's so important. But if you want to read uh, The Star Principle by Richard Koch, well written, it's not very sort of technical, and the guy's a genius beyond any kind of type of genius I can think of. There are two or three people in the world that I think match that level of investing genius, including Warren Buffett. I'm that serious about it. The second thing is that they're launching really aggressively. If a market is valuable, and if by dominating you get higher profit because you are the preferred supplier, you have the social proof, you can get higher price when you sell it. And because you have economies of scale, because you're selling more of it, you can get a lower buy price, so you get more profit, right? So it's really, really worth having. And if you think you can dominate a market, the only real thing to do, if you can, is launch very aggressively. So low price, high ad spend, and go at it like a bull at a gate. That is definitely a characteristic of the mastermind members. Sometimes it doesn't work, but when the payoff comes, it's so big, it makes up for the losses. And you just got to obviously survive cash flow wise until the losses. Another conversation. The other thing they're doing is hyper targeted PPC. I'm obviously under the non disclosure, I can't disclose the details of what they're doing, but let me give you a hint that you need to get exact match keywords for each product and hammer at those. Find the keywords that really matter, in other words, the leashes you're trying to dominate, and hammer at those hard. Don't spread scattergun. You can do a bit of scattergun for research, but eventually you're going to want to hone it down to a few keywords that matter and then hammer the hell out of those. So that's a bit of some little tactical tip. The Taoist chef, well, let me tell you about the Taoist chef. So there was once, um, way back in the day, so Taoism, by the way, is, is that thing that, that in the modern day looks like, you know, there's Chinese guys in the park doing this weird type stuff. Anyone know what this might be? It's a bit hard to do with a microphone. Tai Chi, exactly, yeah, good. I haven't got any more money for beers, but yeah, you would get one. So, Tai Chi, yeah. But they come up with a lot more profound thinking than that. And there's one guy who was speaking to, there was a, the kings in those days were quite wise. They were willing to talk to ordinary people. And there's a guy speaking to a chef, expert, and he says, why are you so amazing at cutting up oxen? Which was a big thing in China. I guess like if you did it in the Excel center, you get arrested, so don't try this at home. But uh, he said, yeah, ordinary butchers just chop at an ox. They see it as one big lump. And they just hack away, and they have to change the blade once a week because it falls apart. Um, a really decent one will look at it and they'll see the shoulder joint connects to the backbone and they'll see it as a massive individual parts and they change their blade once a month. He said, but I just look at it, you know, after three years of doing it, I just let my intuition guide me. So he's got this blend of seeing it as a whole, but also individual parts. He says, I never change my blade because I know exactly how to find this slicing in between the bones to keep it sharp. So if you want to be a butcher, that might be useful advice. But the point of this is, it's a metaphor for, most people think either or versus both and. This comes from Jim Collins, the writer of Good to Great, Get Great by Choice, amazing books, again. And there's that old Amazon versus Shopify debate, which again, is a false dichotomy. You shouldn't be thinking either or, but both and, especially if you're trying to scale a serious business. And together, another couple of things that people often fight between concepts, like I've been showing you big picture concepts versus strategy and tactics, 10 black hat, you know, ranking hacks or whatever. The truth is you need to blend the two. It's not either or, you have to have both if you're gonna really build a serious business. So not Amazon versus off Amazon, both, both on Amazon and off Amazon. And this is really one of the things that the guys are doing the mastermind especially the last 12 months, I would say, it's really accelerating. And I think this is, those guys are normally six to 12 months ahead. I'm now starting to see people bring courses out about this. So it's gonna be the next big thing to get in there first. So first level, as I said, seeing everything's one big lump. The second thing is seeing divisions. You're either on Amazon or off Amazon. Shopify versus Amazon, artificial distinction. And then the next thing is seeing it as a whole, your business as a whole, but made of distinct but connected parts, right? So Amazon, if you break it down into distinct parts, it's not one big lump, it's three things. It's traffic, 
loads of people searching. It's sales, the conversion rates are amazing, and it's fulfillment, FBA, and does an incredible job of fulfillment. But those are actually three different things that can be on Amazon or off Amazon, and both, let me explain. So for example, the simplest business model is you've got your traffic on Amazon, you have organic only sales, no advertising, you've got sales on Amazon, and you fulfill on FBA. Second example, you have your traffic on Amazon, organic and sponsored ads and headline ads and whatever they bring out next, because they're bringing a lot of stuff out. And off Amazon, you can do Google SEO, Instagram and Pinterest. Those are three of the big areas that have been really, really working increasingly for mastermind members this year. When it comes to sales, you can do Amazon and Shopify and Magento, etc. And quite a few people in the mastermind do that. I would say that's less of a thing to worry about if you're going to focus on one thing. Focus on off Amazon traffic, but going to Amazon as a sales channel because you don't have to do all Shopify, all off Amazon, or all on Amazon. Remember, you can blend it. And the fulfillment, you might do FBA for fast moving stuff, but Amazon will punish you, especially in the US at this time of year, if you have too much stock stored for more than three months. It will hit your IPI, your inventory performance index, uh, which, if you've ever had that happen, is painful for various reasons. So you might choose to keep it in a third party warehouse and then send stuff into Amazon. If you're selling really bulky stuff like furniture, whatever, it might be good to just fulfill directly off Amazon. So keep an open mind. Third thing then is, as I said, influence and audiences. The first thing you can do is borrow an audience. So if you have somebody with a podcast or a YouTube channel, whatever, you can just say, hi, can I mention my products on your um, channel? Somebody did it to me yesterday. I wrote back, I said, well, I'm probably not gonna help you sell widgets to the masses, but if you wanna have an interview about it, that's fine. So it's gotta be at the right person with the right audience, but if you're selling you know, dog food, go and talk to a dog food um, specialist. There's probably, I haven't looked, there's probably a YouTube channel out there that specializes in dogs and dog food, probably, because we live in a world of, niche, of niches. So just make sure the audience is relevant. If you have the greatest dog food in the world and you're trying to sell it to cat owners, it's game over, right? So that's the only caveat there. So the, the places that have been really working in terms of channels, Pinterest, which is really growing uh, the last few months, um, Instagram, bloggers as well, still very powerful if they're good at SEO. And then of course, there's the really difficult option, but if you really want to build a brand, um, this is the best way, which is creating an audience. So again, Pinterest, Instagram, SEO, um, which I know a couple of the members of the mastermind have started to run an agency specializing in that. So if you want to chat to them afterwards, I can make an introduction for a modest fee. Oh, I'm kidding, I, I, won't make, I won't charge you. And Facebook groups, which is really killing it. I don't have time to go into the detail, but Facebook groups is, I, I've, I've suspected for about three years, having run one for the podcast and for anyone, how many people are in about at least three Facebook groups for, 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 for Amazon? Come on guys, you Amazon sellers? At least 10, keep your hands up. At least 20, keep your hands up. Okay, good, so as Amazon sellers, like training ourselves in Amazon, we all know about Facebook groups. As e-commerce sellers, hardly anyone's doing anything with them. And I've, I've seen that, it's been a gaping goal, open goal for three years, as far as I've been concerned. And finally, one of the mastermind members is really making it work. Um, so, time to go into it, but that is something you might want to investigate. Again, if you want to look into any one of these areas, if you just Google, you'll find a ton of people willing to take your money in return for training, right? But I'm, so I'm giving you the big picture because I trust that the small picture details are out there. And last but not least, email. Again, email's been out there about the longest of any digital medium. It preceded the World Wide Web, in fact, right? The CERN guys talking to each other back in Switzerland in the 80s. Guess what? Email marketing is not only not done, not dead. It, it's done so ferociously badly by nearly everyone in my inbox. There is a gaping gap if you can do it well. And I say that with confidence because one of the mastermind members has just taken one of his clients off Amazon mostly, but off also on Amazon. They've got their Shopify sales up from about $200,000 a month to $600,000 through Facebook ads and email marketing. Old school, but worth checking out. If you really want to find the right, the guru of that is Andre Chaperon. If you want me to spell his name, come find me at the end if you really want to get into, you're good at writing. So let me just summarize then. So what they've been doing, as opposed to seeing the doing bit is off Amazon traffic, driving on Amazon sales, as well as picking a market you can dominate. There's no substitute for that. The options for in-house marketing are massive. You can send the traffic once you've got it anywhere you like, but sending it back to Amazon is smart because Amazon has amazing conversion rates, right? If you get fed up with Jeff Bezos owning your customers' information and you want to build an empire, you send it to Shopify. But there's nothing wrong with going off Amazon traffic onto Amazon. And Amazon loves external traffic. 
they absolutely love you. I've been I was talking to Brad Moss the other day for an interview, which is coming out soon. He used to run Seller Central and he created the Amazon Seller app. That's how in Amazon he was, right? And he said, yeah, he's seeing amazing ranking boosts in, in his agency clients for people sending off Amazon traffic to Amazon. Because it's hard, but it's valuable. Most hard things, and most valuable things are hard, right? So um, Amazon then gives you a massive organic ranking boost, as, as Brad was saying to me the other day, and he's a man who absolutely knows. One or two of his clients are doing over $100 million a year on Amazon. So he really knows. Plus, you can control off Amazon traffic. Well, at least you can influence. You can't make an audience turn up. But once they've turned up, and thank you very much, Excel, then you can try and connect. And in the end, I use the word influence before the word audiences, because if I connect to a room of 20 people really strongly about my products, or in this case, I'm trying to sell you an idea, which is the 80-20 principle, that the star principle, the Taoist chef, which I hope you get what I'm trying to say there, and uh, the third thing, influence. I'm trying to sell you an idea, but I'd rather have a group of 20 people that I can sell the idea powerfully to three people than have a thousand people who aren't engaged. And if you're looking for influences to work with, I cannot stress enough. I just cannot stress enough. Engagement trumps audience size by like a trillion dollars. I, I mean, that's a really ridic ridiculous non-statistic I just made up in my mind. But uh, I have the world's smallest email list and the, and the earnings per subscriber is about $100 each. So it doesn't really matter that it's a small email list because it's still very valuable. I, I can get $100,000 over three, four years out of an audience of 1,000 people if they're really engaged because I've personally done that with Amazing FBA. It's not an e-commerce example, but it is something I can speak to. Again, I'm mentioning email, guys. Hint, email. If you're crap at it, hire somebody, because it's not easy to do well. You can't just slap a few words together and think you've done the job. But if you do it well, like it costs nothing. I mean, it costs something to hire a writer, but you don't pay for Facebook ads continuously with email. I'm in love with email marketing, but it's just me. So to conclude, our aim is to see like the 1%, more than just doing what they're doing, see like them first, understand why they're doing stuff. So remember these three lenses, the STAR principle. Go read the book, Richard Koch, K-O-C-H. An incredible book. I actually bought, and sorry guys, <laughs> I actually bought 10 copies of this for the mastermind, and they're still sitting at home because I didn't take them into the meeting because I'm that disorganized. But that's how much I believed in it. I was gonna give it to everyone when they walked through the door, like you must read this, it's obligatory. Anyone in the 1% or who's close to it, read this book, do not mess about, it's vital. So I'm sorry that I didn't do that. I'll bring it next time for a late Christmas present. The Taoist chef, remember, seeing everything as one big lump or a thousand details, it's normal when you learn something new that you'll see it in, in one of those two ways. But eventually, you want to see that your business is a whole but made of distinct parts that have distinct functions. And the simple version of that is Amazon does three different things, traffic, sales or conversions, and fulfillment. And you don't have to do all three on Amazon. It's cool to split it up. And that simplifies life a lot. If you're selling like, you know, speakers the size of that thing, you might do fulfilled by merchant, i.e. from your garage or whatever, your warehouse. But that doesn't mean you can't um, use a Pinterest um, influencer to send traffic. It doesn't mean you can't sell on Amazon, for example, right? You can mix and match. It's not that complicated. The third lens, of course, as I keep going about influence, it's the coming trend. Amazon loves external traffic. If you find the right influencers, I think they're still underpriced, right? In two years' time, somebody who will give you a, a free write-up, as I know somebody from Mastermind said the other day, a free demonstration of their product to a really engaged audience, and they're, they're even very beautiful and very charming as well, which is a nice bonus because your audience will engage with them. But in two years' time, that lady's gonna be charging a thousand bucks a time, I swear, because they will realize the, the value of that. So right now, influencer marketing is underpriced. Get in there. That's my main, main thing to say about that. So in the end, if you want to succeed where others don't, you need to change your lenses and enter the mindset of the 1%. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Actually, if we're gonna do questions, I probably ought to use. Sorry, we don't, yeah, a few questions. I'll repeat the question back so we get it on order. Yeah. Go on, say it again. With email marketing and yeah. Well, that's an excellent question. I'm very, very glad you asked that question. You see, people that do it properly, like Andre Chaperon, it's 100% permission marketing. Not only should you not be sending people an email that they didn't ask you to send, it's bad marketing anyway. It always has been. 
If I'm hammering you with, you know, let's say weight loss pills, to put it politely, all the other things we'll get in the inbox for changing your anatomy, shall we say, right? That's, that's, there's no indication that you were ever interested in that. And the simple solution is, you don't want those people anyway. You want, like I said, if you get a list of a thousand people that really, really, really care about chihuahua food that keeps their, their chihuahua happy, it's gonna take you sweat to get those people, but not that much. If you talk to an influencer who is, I've got a YouTube follower of Chihuahua owners, and I bet you any money you like, like, sorry, I, I already owe beer, so I shouldn't, that there's somebody doing that, maybe 10. It's amazing what's out there. Then if you manage to get a few of those guys over to your website, like maybe 100 and you, you close like 20 of them, you could probably sell half of those stuff. So to come back to your point, um, GDPR shouldn't be an issue if it is, you're spamming, and that's crap marketing anyway, because it's, you're going to get your... your you're gonna get um, blacklisted, or you might get your, a lot of your emails gonna end up in the spam. Uh, your email provider might ban your account anyway, but also it would do the opposite and you'll be fine. But thanks for the question, it's a very good question. Yeah. Thanks, uh, interesting speech, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, how relevant are these principles to business to business and commerce as well as business to consumer? Well, I've got two responses. The first is I don't know from experience at all. But what I can say is the 80-20 the principle um, applies to everything in the planet. In my experience, I've yet to meet anything that it doesn't apply to. It applies to human height, but it's not really extreme. The STAR principle is written by Richard Koch, who doesn't sell physical widgets. Um, he invested in Betfair and he invested in Belgo, you know, the Belgian restaurants and various other things. So I would say from that, some of which is it's mostly business consumer, but I don't think there's any difference. I would guess the influencer marketing side would be different. But again, you know what? I think people underestimate. If you are business to business, LinkedIn, that's it. Gary Vaynerchuk's raving about it. I've started getting serious about it recently. And the organic reach on LinkedIn is insane compared to Facebook. I put up something on Facebook page, two, five, 10, 20 views. I'll put it on LinkedIn with a video. I can get two, 300 views quite easily. So if you get an influence on LinkedIn, like he's just got a big following, of the right kind, again, message to market match, so critical, the right kind of people, that might win for you. I mean, it could be Instagram, it depends on the products, right? But thanks, good question. Let's go first. So uh, with the star principle, you mentioned that, um, obviously if you've got a dog products, you're not really gonna get very far. So how would you advise sort of market research to, um, I guess, identify products that are gonna be stars? Okay, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? Or the million dollar question, I guess, to, to, to inflate it. Well, first of all, the dog products thing was only an example of don't sell dog products to cat owners. I'm sure there's money to be made in dog products. I know because one of the it, people I've, I've worked with in the past has done that. So, um, yeah, it's a $64,000 question, but the, the answer, the simple, the big picture answer is do not enter a market you can't dominate, which means, it, I haven't got an example here, but if you look at a market, for example, where there's $100,000 being done in back braces in per month in America, it's probably much bigger. Let's say that in the UK, about £100,000. If you see that somebody's doing £30,000 a month, they've got 30% of the market, they're going to be hard to shift, stay out of that market. If you see a market and you've got, say, £20,000 in your back pocket to play with, don't start playing in big markets. That's one thing. Decide your budget first and then shop appropriately. Maybe you could look at a £50,000 a month market, and maybe the base bestseller is doing about £6,000 or whatever. You want to get in there and sell £15,000 a month. And, and that's the best thing I can say is, what it does is helps you filter out a lot of potential markets super fast. You look at it, dominated by somebody, move on. Dominated, move on. The other thing is, if you've got £10,000 in your pocket, and you want to go into a market with $500,000 a month in sales, you're on drugs, so you're never ever going to get close to dominance. Stay the hell out. It's like me opening a little coffee shop next to Starbucks that sells the same damn stuff for more money. And it sounds insane, but it's what everybody does. They bring me products. It's more expensive than the competition. It's indistinguishable from the competition. It looks the same. And they have like a tiny percentage of the market. I'm like, don't do this. Dominate or don't enter. It's the only way to go. I hope that answers your question. Do you have a question in the back? Yeah, let me come through with the mic. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Omar Pryor, the label seller. Mm. Uh, the Sorry. question was regarding the traffic, because I just heard on another talk uh, that Amazon is uh, prioritizing conversion. So rather than having as much traffic as you can to your listing, 
he said, he said it's better to just have less traffic but better conversion. What is your thought about that? Please? Hmm. Well, it's quite a technical question, so I'm probably not the best place person in this place to answer that. I mean, someone like Danny McMillan is around. He did a keynote earlier. He'd be a good person to talk to about that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I do know there's a sort of hack in between, which is the add to cart thing, which right now is working. So if people go to your listing, add it to cart, but don't buy, that still counts towards the algorithm. That feels to me like it's got to be a hack that they're going to close in the next three, three to six months. I don't know when. But... Here's the thing I would say anyway, again, a bit like the GDPR question, just um, the most important thing is message to market match, right? Um, and closely related, but not the same thing, is product to market match. Product to market match is I've got a kind of dog food, cat food audience, forget it, right? The second thing is message to market match. If you're selling dog food to people who care about Chihuahua's health and don't care about the environment, you sell them something that poisons the environment but is engraving for their health. And that sounds like a joke, but I've had very similar things recently. Honestly, if you do that and then you only send traffic that is super targeted to that thing, you'll do well, you'll get conversions. And then you're all good because Amazon and you both love conversions because it makes you money, it makes Amazon money, it makes the customer money. So there's no way that's ever going to go wrong. The other question, it's going to vary over time, depending on how hungry Amazon is for external traffic. It goes through waves, how much they reward you or not. But please understand what I'm saying. I'm not just saying chuck traffic as numbers, high quantity. Quality is critical. I hope that's coming across from what I said. I'd rather have like a thousand absolutely rabid Chihuahua owners going to my dog food listing than a million random dog owners, hardly any of whom are going to convert. Because, yeah, that probably is going to hurt your listing. But also, why bother? There's this stupid thing to do in the first place. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Any other questions, guys? I don't know if I have to move on. Or... Great. Thanks for the questions. I'm really glad because I love interactive stuff. That's why I do a mastermind rather than speeches all the time. Thanks very much for listening, guys. Very much appreciated. Cheers.